so people coming in so i think uh, we can uh, we can start uh, softly welcoming uh, everybody good morning good afternoon or good evening uh, depending where, where where you are we are here uh, split in uh, in two european country myself in italy near milano and tino is in belgium so thanks for for joining us for this webinar today today's subject is uh, Functional safety management. Uh, not spending any word on on, on that because uh, uh, Tino will uh, will will uh, will speak extensively about that. Uh, let me just give some very very small introduction. I will be. I promise uh, I will be fast. Uh, let me spend some few words about uh, uh, who we are. Uh, Tino, our functional safety director at the GMI. It's our guest speaker today. I'm just here, let me say, facilitating uh, the communication. Uh, but the, the most interesting things you will hear from, uh, from Tino. I'm Mauro from I'm GMI, of course, uh, and I'm Sales, uh, Global Sales Director. Uh, what GMI, just a few words about GMI, what GMI is doing. Uh, GMI is uh, is doing field interface uh, uh, for for automation. Uh, you can find GMI in most of uh, automation packages, uh, DCS, CSD, and gas, and so on. Uh, in uh, in many of the industrial sector, like oil and gas, chemical, petrochemical, we have 40 year experience. We are fully producing our goods, our material uh, equipment in uh, in. Italy, 100%, but we are, of course, present uh, worldwide, uh, all over the world, all over the continent. Um, of course, we produce electronic equipment. We deal with safety. That's why quality for us is uh, absolutely uh, one of the most important things, as since, uh, let me say, our product is somehow protect human life, uh, protect the environment, protect the equipment of our customers. Uh, this is just one page collecting the uh, main equipment we, we deliver to, to the industrial sector we mentioned before. We are talking about intrinsic safe barriers, safety relays, isolator. We are dealing with power supply, multiplexer, for temperature, for digital input. Uh, we have termination board, uh, which customi uh, customizes the termination board to connect uh, our equipment to most of the DCS and the ESD system available in the market. We have uh, heart multiplexer, surge protector, loop indicators. Uh, and most of these uh, equipment are either functional safety related, SEAL certified, and or uh, intrinsic safety uh, related. Last bullet is showing functional safety training and services. As a matter of fact, uh, since many years we cooperate with, uh, with Tino and we deliver to market uh, uh, lots of functional safety trainings uh, as well functional safety consulting. But again, I will leave to, to Tino uh, to, to speak a little bit more about that. In addition to that, uh, we deliver also, since a uh, few time, uh, uh, other kinds of trainings related to uh, cybersecurity. Uh, Tino, I'm sure, will uh, introduce this topic, will tell something about, even if it is not the topic of today, but he will mention something about uh, cybersecurity uh, as to be considered as, as part of the functional safety. But again, I'm not entering uh, in, into technical details. As said, we are, uh, as GMI, present worldwide. Also, the, the training uh, uh, I was mentioning, uh, uh, it is delivered worldwide. In the last year, year and a half, uh, in somehow we are forced to do that online which give us the chance uh, uh, to cover uh, the work, okay? Uh, these trainings are available in different uh, timing, just to, 
to, to be able to reach uh, most of the time zone and uh, as much as people possible. Uh, last, one of the last slides before to, to give the speech to, to, um, to, to Tino. This is uh, our uh, short list of, uh, of customer we have divided by type. So we have, we interface, we deal with uh, system vendor, with ETC contractor, with OEM, as well as end user. And uh, uh, we are again available worldwide and our equipment are within the AVL of most of the end, uh, end users worldwide. Let me, okay, I reached the point to, to leave the speech to, to Tino. Just a few service information. Uh, this, uh, this webinar is recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. So uh, if uh, you miss some topic, some aspect that you would like to see that, or you would like to recommend the same to some colleague, you have the chance to, to to follow this the same uh, on uh, on the YouTube as well you will all receive an email uh, with this slide PDF version of this presentation and of course uh, uh, yeah you have our contact uh, in case of any additional need you can you can you can get in touch with us so Tino I leave the speech to you okay thank you um do you have to switch off the remote control or you leave it on it, i don't think it, it matters does it i will uh, give it to you i have no more okay. control now all right so welcome everyone from my behalf also as Mauro was saying we are not sitting physically in the same country i'm actually based in uh, belgium this week it is not our first film safety management uh, webinar we have been giving. According to my records, we have done the same just a year ago in July and in between one and October. But we have done several topics around the film safety. This is more the general uh, webinar session, which is about the management of film safety. And what you see here on this slide, for those who are not familiar with the standard IEC 61511, or when maybe people from the US or the uh, North America region are watching the webinar now, well, this is called with you the ISA uh, 61511, that's the version 2018. With us back in Europe, that's the version 2016. So the food safety management lifecycle, as you can see over here, is just boxes all connected to each other with some numbers in there. And the boxes, they represent some activities, activities which you are carrying out during the safety life cycle of your safety instrumented system. And the left one, the left side over here, which is uh, red lined for the moment or outlined in red, is called management of functional safety and functional safety assessment and functional safety auditing. So those three topics, FSM, Film safety assessment and film safety audits are the general items which are applicable for whatever activity you are involved in here. And if you look in the, in the top, in the middle over here, where my cursor is hovering, you see here activity box number one. That is the start of any project. Typically, that's the process hazard and risk assessment. That's the HRA, as we used to refer to in the life cycle, which is phase number one. That is where you will identify the hazards. You will try to analyze the hazards in terms of the frequency, the likelihood, and also the consequence or the severity of the consequence. And then you will try to allocate safety functions to existing layers, existing protection layers that you may already have in your installation and see how much risk reduction credit you could assign to those existing layers, if you can trust them or, or not. And if you need some additional safety risk reduction, that is where you will start to write here the safety requirement specification. What I just explained you here in phase one, two, three are all separate webinars. As Mauro was saying, everything has been recorded on YouTube uh, channel from GMI. That means that you can replay and listen again to all the other topics which I already mentioned here in the last two or three minutes. Once you are moving to design and engineering, 
Sorry, Maro. Excuse me, you know, yes, sorry to you. Uh, I was just thinking I forgot to, to, to mention that uh, um, the participant may have the chance uh, to raise a question by the uh, question and answer box. Uh, I will monitor that. So if you have question, you just type it uh, and I will interrupt as I have done right now. You know, to, to raise the question that you would like. Uh, okay, good. Like so, Sorry. yes, there is, there is a QA box. There is no chat box. We are not chatting on, in this webinar. We're just capturing the QA. And as Maro is saying, he will monitor and stop me if necessary. Anyhow, it's not my intention today to go to the entire life cycle. What I just would like to highlight to you is I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with one or more of those life cycle activities. But I'm also pretty sure that most of you maybe are not aware that food safety management is a normative requirement which addition to, and I'm talking about 2016 edition two of the SIG 1511, has been tremendously pushing the pressure on the engineers on to prove that the activities as are done as per the standard requirements. That is going to be part of the food safety management. So let me continue to the next slide. So what is now management of functional safety? Well, I'm pretty sure that most of your companies that you work for, they, they have a QMS or a quality management system, something like ISO 9001. And the QMS is kind of a procedure where lots of things are being described. The question is, how much in your daily activities are you following that QMS or that quality management system? That's going to be very similar to what we will require over here in the 6511 life cycle. Management of functional safety addresses systematic failures, mostly caused by humans. Of course, the good news is if you don't do anything, you can never make a mistake. But of course, that's not how it works. We all have to do something. That means the moment we are tasked to do an activity, potentially with requirements very clearly described, maybe not following the requirements carefully, maybe we misunderstood them, maybe we make a human interpretation, subjectivity, mistake, whatever is, is the reason. But of course, human failures can never be predicted. Human failures can never be really controlled because we do not know when they will happen. The only thing what we can do is we can try to increase the quality on how we execute our activities in the hope that by increasing the quality, by putting on top of it assessments and audits, that we'll try to minimize human failures. That's the whole main target or objective of management of functional safety, that is to increase the quality of the activities that the engineer has been accountable or responsible for. Mauro, this, this question that just came in, uh, it, will, it will be answered during the uh, webinar and also I even added this in the Q&A section because that is question yes. came in a few few times. So applying a food safety management is increasing the quality of the activities through the entire life cycle phase. It doesn't matter if you are the engineer responsible to calibrate a transmitter or you are one of the team members of a HAZOP or you are maybe the design engineer who is designing maybe a safety in instrumented function or maybe you are the wiring specialist who is doing some marshalling wiring in one of your safety cabinets. Function safety management is for everyone and not only for a dedicated specialized safety company, it is also included for the operating company or for the end user. Function safety cannot be implemented without involvement of humans. So it's like a catch 22. It's like the chicken before the egg or the egg before the chicken. The moment you start to introduce that the human has to be involved, we know that you need to be very careful on how to check the quality of the activities where that human person has been responsible for. So any personnel involved in a safety life cycle activity from an operating company, from an EPC or an engineering company, from a vendor, or anybody who interacts with the safety systems, it is for everyone. Excuse me, Tino. Sure. There is another question. Yeah, please. You, you may have a look. Of a systematic failure addressed by FSM. 
Well, it is indirectly addressed by a functional safety assessment. The functional safety assessment, stage one, two, three, four, and five. Let me just go back here. So you have here stage one in between three and four. You have stage two in between four and five. You have stage three in between five and six. Well, the first three stages needs to be carried out by a senior competent person, which is not involved in a design team. And that person or team of people where one senior expert or senior uh, competent person will be responsible. Well, that person needs to make an expert judgment based on a, as I said, a judgment that the activities has been carried out correctly. And in theory, by the standards, you cannot move on from one phase to another without carrying out your functional safety assessment independent from a design team for one, two, three. And now comes the same independent from the operator and maintenance of the same SIS for stages uh, four and five, which is for mainly the end user or the operating company. So FSM, see this as a quality management scheme. It's a quality management scheme that has enough instructions and monitoring principles on how to monitor the activities of the engineers that has been carried out. So <clears throat> functional safety management is a quality scheme to reduce the human failure during all the activities of that life cycle, which I mentioned on the previous slide already. The policy and strategy for achieving such functional safety shall be identified together with certain methods for evaluating, as I just mentioned, monitoring their achievement and shall be communicated within that organization. That is also very important. Sometimes those assessments, which also have been part of with some end users, well, when we are finding some gaps or we're finding some items which are not as per the standard requirements, that needs to be communicated throughout the entire, let's say, uh, department who is responsible for that type of activities. FSM is an ongoing and evolving mechanism. It's not because you have done an FSM five years ago that today your activity in your engineering departments are still handled correctly. It's a daily ongoing mechanism to try to find out that people are not taking shortcuts are not filling in just tick boxes without really doing the work because we all have been there. We all are engineers, we're all very creative on paper. And if we believe the paper can please another person, then we think the job is done. That is not what functional safety culture is all about. Functional safety culture is really that the paper doesn't prove anything. We wanna see evidence on how it has been done and why it was been done this way. And of course, we're gonna use some paper, some reports, some checklists, something for that but we not take paper for granted. We actually were asked to ask some questions. We're gonna be, let's say, when we make an expert judgment, it is our job or our task to challenge the engineer to think besides the tick box and see what did he or she maybe not considered during filling in that list. The 6.15.11 lets you focus or lets you choose between the Fung Safety Management or they say, you can follow the FSM shall meet the requirements from the 61508, which is the one for the vendor specific, like for GMI as an example. And that standard 61508 has been out since 1997, was then a normative requirement, remained a normative requirement in the edition two from 2010, and does remain a normative requirement in the maintenance revision number three, which is not being released yet. Or, and that is my advice, do not try the first bullet, try the second bullet. Why? Because the second bullet will be a lot more flexible for a system integrator, for a engineering company, or even for an end user, than to try to follow the same very strict requirements from the 6.15.08. In other words, the 6.15.11 Fung Safety Management, which is described in chapter five from part number one, 6.15.11, sorry, 2016, well, FSM shall meet the requirements of the standard derived from the 61508 to which the function safety claims are made in this case here, 61511. That is my recommendation, as I just mentioned, clause five or chapter five is management of functional safety. There was a new question coming in, Maru. I just yes. said. Yeah. Okay, I'll read the question. Uh, thank you for that. So since the key component of FSM is the people, 
How do we ensure in practical terms that the competencies of everyone involved, FSM, is kept at optimum levels? That's a very good question. Well, there is a new requirement in the edition two that once you shall prove that anyone carrying out activities are competent in the activities where they are responsible slash accountable for the question is, how do you do that? If you say, look, my name is X, I know everything. How can I understand I know everything? How do you prove that? So when you're talking about the word competency, what Mauro was just mentioning, my main task with GMI and my main task in the process industry for nearly the last 20 years now is mainly teaching functional safety throughout the industry worldwide. And what we do is we need to give formal training. And with the formal training, we need to have, of course, also some experience that we need to check. And the third chapter from competency and outcomes is always how do you check the know-how? The know-how can be checked only by doing a test, an interview, an exam, but cannot, just, cannot be just measured based on the number of years you're working in a certain activity. I give you a very simple and also maybe a stupid example. All the engineers worldwide, they're all using Excel spreadsheet from Microsoft. My first blunt question then when I'm doing an assessment is, who is not using Excel spreadsheet? Of course, no one raises his hand because an engineer, they all use Excel spreadsheets. My second question is then, who of you has been trained in the revision of Excel spreadsheet that you are using today? And then when you are really extremely lucky, and when you are maybe just catching an engineer, he may raise his hand and said, I was trained a couple of years ago. In my case, I was trained, and I'm, I, I want to admit this here, I was trained in 1989. It was Windows, I think, version 3. It was on a very old personal computer. Do I feel competent today to Excel? Of course not, because I do not know all the details of the software anymore, but I don't need them because I only do subtraction and multiplication and all that. Macros, I cannot use macros. I don't understand them. So what I'm trying to say is, in our safety activities, that's the same problem we have. Many people start the job. They take over the job from the guy who just left. They are jumping into the sea. They are totally in the deep. They have no real good information other than use that software tool that the previous guy was also using. You're an engineer, you figure it out, and you may figure it out. But the question is, how do you prove you are competent in what, you've, what you are actually are doing? And that's a sensitive question. So summary, competency reviews are done by third parties, mainly today in the market. One of the leading ones is also the one that I am following together with GMI is from TOV Rhineland. I think on top of my head, we have more than 17,000 engineers worldwide proving they are competent in the domain of the activities of the 61511. But by the addition two, that is not sufficient. Addition two is now asking you shall periodic assess the competencies of all the engineers involved. So yet again, it's an ongoing assessment. It doesn't stop by passing your exam and, and showing the certificate saying I'm competent. It's also an ongoing process because maybe tomorrow you will receive a new instrument in the field that may need some additional skills or training or know-how and that needs to be proven. And that is what it is all about. How do you prove the competencies? So, FSM objectives. The first bullet is, if you remember that life cycle with all these boxes, we need to define those activities exactly what are they that the people will have to carry out. We need to define also with what documentation, requirement specifications can they use to carry out those activities. And the third one here, how will you monitor? That means how do I prove that I follow the instruction, the requirements correctly? And then come the previous question, how do we know that the human has done it correctly? Well, there needs to be an independent assessment. You cannot make your own assessment because you never recognize or maybe never admit your own mistakes. So the assessments, there is a reason why independency is the key issue by any assessment that you may be involved in the future. That is to do with the implementation of all the technical and all the non-technical or the management activities 
for the life cycle of the SIS stands for safety instrumented systems. The second bullet objective for fuel safety management are two items. We need to specify who is responsible or what activities on a personal level, on a department level, and on an organization level. That needs to be specified, which are necessary to ensure that the functional safety objectives of that activity by that, let's say, person, department, or third party organization has been met by those who were responsible for that. And the second bullet, as I just already mentioned, assessments are independency. It's the measurement to answer if the quality has been reached, yes or no. And yet again, that is subjective. You hire two assessors independent from each other. The one will say he is not happy with this, this, this. The other one may pick totally different points because we're all humans. We all have a different view on what we judge is correct or not. And that is the whole subjectivity also in those assessments. So it's certainly not an easy task. Right, Maro, we have the first poll coming in to see how many people yeah. are still awake. <laughs> yeah, we are looking for some feedback from, uh, from you. So uh, we have this easy question and the question is, where FS, FSM is, uh, is required, and we would like to have your uh, yeah, I will read the poll opinion. in the meantime, Maro. So the question is, I, IEC 61511, food safety management is required. The first answer during the analysis phases of the IEC 61511, so that is mainly for the EPC contractors in the first three phases in the design, etc. Then during the design phase, detailed design phases of the IC 61511 life cycle. Then for the end users during the operator and maintenance phases of the life cycle. D, during all the phases of the 61511 except the decommissioning phases. And E, always for all the phases of the IC 61511. That's a giveaway. So that's an easy yeah. question, but that's just to play around with a few interactivities here. So let's wait a few seconds again. Yeah. We still have it a few costs, people that have yeah, clicked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I click it, it costs no money, so. So those who already, thank you. Those who haven't clicked, try, try to find the button to click, the mouse to click, whatever. And give us a few extra clicks here so then we can start to continue okay oh, i think we you. can uh, one two yeah great okay yes. Maru, we there good thank you very much so i closed the poll and uh, i will i'm going to share the result with you okay there it is. well as you can see the majority have all clicked the last one always for all the phases of the life cycle no matter what activity you're in is of course the only most and the only most correct answer because you have to do it during the analysis design ops and maintenance even decommissioning we have to do it everywhere but that that was an easy poll but it's just oh. a bit of a an interactivity game we are playing here with you to see if you're still alert or not all right thank you maru i will stop sharing and close that okay so oh, we can proceed so the question earlier that came in this morning, and there's also already somewhere in the Q&A session that I will run through after I finish with this webinar, we go to the question and answers from questions received from people during the registrations. And I picked a few of, uh, I always pick a few of, let's say, the more interesting questions. Like if someone asks a question, what is the weather like in Belgium, then I don't even bother to answer. But if it is a real sensible question, then I like to answer the engineer that put the effort to put the question on paper or at least in the registration form. So who shall follow and use a film safety management? That's a very simple, very simple answer. It's everyone. And I like to underline everyone because some people somehow around the world believe, oh, it's only for the vendor of the safety PLCs or it's only of the vendor who is maybe the engineering contractor. It's not for us because we're only the system integrator. We only have a small box here and, you know, we're not doing much. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Everyone. 
who is doing, fulfilling an activity in the life cycle of that safety instrumented system cannot comply to the function safety standard without applying function safety management. So regardless, if you're working for a three or 5,000 employee size EPC contractor, or you're working for a 12 people system integrator, it doesn't matter. Those who are fulfilling an activity in the life cycle from a system integrator to a manufacturer, to an operating company itself. And that is, that is the other point. I meet often end users, operating company engineers, and they say, hey, you know what? During the quotations, we have asked that company to prove us they have an FSM. Good, eh? I said, very good. And then I ask him, what do you do with this documentation? Oh, we just sort that with our project documentation. I said, and do you have in your department from engineering, from maintenance, from operator and maintenance in your, uh, in your end user site, do you have an FSM? No, we don't need that. Said, so why do you ask then the vendors to have one if you don't have one? Because you, Mr. End user, you are providing an activity called operation and maintenance. And that's described clearly black and white in the standard. So again, yet again, it is for everyone fulfilling an activity in that life cycle. Why do we say it so strongly? Well, simply speaking, 2016, when the release came out, edition two of the 6.15.11, black on white, and this is quoted from the standard, if a supplier, no matter what a supplier is, it can be a maintenance engineer supplying a service, or it can be a vendor supplying a barrier with a SIL X on it, or it can be a EPC contractor supplying a HAZOP team in a study. Well, if a supplier makes any functional safety claims for a product or a service, that means it's always a product or a, or a service, which are used to demonstrate compliance with the 61511, well, then that supplier shall have a FSM system in place. And you may say, well, that's easy. That's just some paper, some formality. Hang on, hang on. Second or last bullet over here. That supplier shall have procedures in place to demonstrate how adequate they have been using that function safety management system on those last activities. Give a simple example. A system integrator may have a great FSM, but the team working on the project do not know what the FSM content really means. That doesn't make sense. Equally, it doesn't make sense to be very proud on your quality ISO 9001 logo behind your reception, which I saw last, last week when I walked into an office. And they were very proud to say we have ISO 9001. If I would ask a question to the engineer on the project, what is in the quality management system? Can you prove me how you have been using that today on your daily job? Would you be able to do that? Well, that's the question we're gonna ask on food safety management also. Does it make sense to have a monster of a food safety management procedure if you cannot prove how you have been using it? So the purpose is to use it and to prove how you have been using it in the hope that you will have minimized making mistakes. What is now in the FSM? Without to going too much in details, I just want to give you a few of the snippets or a few of the, let's say, the highlights. And the black color bullets here are actually the bullets from the standard. If you would take the standard IEC 61511 or ISA 61511 in front of you, you would go to chapter number, sorry, chapter. You would go to part number one. There are three parts, but you take the normative part one and you go to chapter number five, which is close number five. That's the food safety management. Well, the first bullet you will read is the organization and resources. What do we want to describe in the FSM on a, on a company? Well, we, we need to see the persons. And if you have been following one of the trainings, like I mentioned you before, the food safety engineer from TOV Rhineland, that certificate on your personal name will be part of your personal documentation to prove your competency in your activities, which you are accountable for. We also will see your um, or organigram of your company, which department or which subcontractors you are using, what are their responsibilities, competencies, all of that must be in the first bullet. Second bullet, second bullet is to do with the risk evaluation and risk management. 
standard is very clearly saying hazards shall be identified and the risk shall be evaluated and then the risk shall be reduced to whatever your tolerable risk has been set. And as Mauro was just mentioning before, in one of these pictures with all the products that GMI was uh, supplying, there was the last bullet was not complete because beside FS training, there's also ATEX training and consultancy. And now the third one is also cybersecurity. And cybersecurity came to light in 2016 edition two. The standard is now saying you shall carry out a security risk assessment on your industrial automation control systems. That means you need to make a security assessment on that installation. Third bullet, safety planning. Everything in safety needs to be planned, activities, when they will be done, by who, et cetera, et cetera. Fourth, fourth bullet is here implementing and monitoring. That means all those great ideas, how do you implement them? And also how will you prove how you have monitored, how you have checked them? Again, FSA, that's food safety assessments, means independency. Verification validation, that's more verification by the detail engineer himself that has been carried out the activities. Whereas the assessment will be done by independent senior judgment, what the verification report is showing. And the last V for validation, that is the end user. You may have heard about an FAT or an SAT, that's a classical activity which we will call a validation of your system. The last two bullets from Fung Safety Management are assessment, audits and revisions. And the new edition two of the 61511 has changed tremendously, stage one, two, three, four and five. Because four and five in the old edition one, which came out 2004 to 2016, was not normative required to carry out. Now edition two, 2016 is requiring all stages one, two, three, four, five. You cannot skip anyone or any any item on the stages needs to be carried out if you want to comply to the functional safety management. And last but not least, sys configuration management. That means that the configuration thinks simply about all your revisions of hardware, all your revisions of firmware, and of your operating systems and of your, uh, I was thinking about the application programs in your safety PLCs, well, all that needs to be kept very clearly and managed by traceability very clearly throughout the life cycle duration of your installation. Okay, Mauro, second Good. call. Yes, we have here now the second out of the three questions uh, we will have today. So let's go and give the chance to vote. I will read the you question want, again. Yeah. For that yeah. model. So in the IEC 6511, functional safety management is, and then they say less important for SIL 1 than for SIL 3 applications, B, not applicable for SIL 4 applications, C, regardless of the SIL classes applicable for all IEC 6511 applications, and D, none of the above. So there are four answers potentially, less important for SIL 1 than for SIL 3, not applicable for SIL 4. Regardless of the SIL, that's answer number C. It is applicable for all the SIL classes and answer D, none of the above. So which one do you guess or believe is the most correct, and the most complete answer? Okay, this time they were uh, fast and then we got Good. almost we all, uh, fast. all input. So. I stop the poll and uh, I share the result. Okay, well, thank you. Here again. we are. Thank you for all the participants who are joining our webinar today. Looks like we have a team of uh, expert specialists listening to me, so I have to be very yes. careful what I'm saying, as I'm always are. But um, regardless of the SIL classes, of course, applicable for all SIG 11 applications, because that's a bit of a tricky question, because those who know standard a little bit better would maybe recall that the 61508 on management has different requirements for SIL 1 than for SIL 2 than for SIL 3. That's not true in the 61511, which is for the process industry, it means that for functional safety, how to, um, how to analyze, design, operate and maintain a SIS, 
in the process industry application standing for oil and gas, uh, chemicals and petrochemicals. New by addition to is food and beverage and also pharmaceutical. So yes, C was the correct answer. There's only uh, one uh, answer here saying none of the above, which was not correct. Okay, I will stop sharing and I will continue. Okay. I took some uh, items out of the TR. I'm just looking at the reference here on the right top corner between brackets source is the IEC. TR stands for Technical Report 61511, report number four, which came out by memory in February 2020. That was just before this uh, infamous COVID-19 situation in the world was forcing us all to do different things in life. Anyhow. This report was being released in uh, February 2020. And for those who do not know what report number four really means on the 6.15.11, it depicts you the differences between edition one and edition two of the 6.15.11. That is the good thing. They give you some, uh, what is now the difference and why have we been releasing edition two to correct or modify or change whatever edition one was asking. That is one thing. But second, what I have done is and I like that one myself. They show the most common misconceptions that the maintenance team of the 6511 has been collecting. And number one bullet was, there was a misbelief apparently in the world. I do not know which area in, in the world this was coming from, but I just summarize here what they were giving us in that report. They say there was a misbelief that the FSM is less important for a SIL 1 and for a SIL 3, which here in our webinar was not true today because we had majority was all saying that's not correct. Second bullet, the project teams typically desire for readily implementable solutions resulting in a formality behavior of ticking a box on a checklist. I will try to translate that in a simple uh, sentence as follows. Some people in their activities, they are treating paper as formality. There's a checkbox, they know when they can check it, but they may not really ask the question in details, what is needed before I'm allowed to tick the box? And food safety management, as we already mentioned, it is a, a living system that needs ongoing on all the people and all the, let's say, the engineer rotations, etc., etc. So it's an ongoing process to try to strive for the quality in the activities in the hope you can make such a great monitoring principle checklist that people will not be allowed or, or capable to tick the box before they have done certain items and can prove them. The worst thing is always when you do an assessment is that people will show you a checklist which is checked by a computer because they all check in the same fashion. And the question is, when did they check them? How did they check them? And how quick did they check those? Those are typical things which we will actually start to alert when we make an assessment. Because I have seen perfect list, everything was ticked, but the work in the field was not even been done. But the list was ticked and everyone was happy on paper. And that's something that we try to eliminate. Third bullet, there is often the desire to defer consideration of performance monitoring and ongoing FSM to after project startup. Well, it's not only after project startup, it's again for the entire life cycle. From day one, when you start the project, that's where FSM needs to start to perform the monitoring. Unfortunately, I do admit here that edition number two, even today, did not require an assessment after the HRA, means your phase number one has been done, your has the risk assessment. They have not asked for a stage assessment already then. They only start to ask it once you have achieved your safety requirement specification. And I personally would say I regret that the committee has not put stages on all the phases, regardless where you are in the beginning of the project or at the end, I would love to see a normative requirement to make an assessment on every single activity, period. Second most common misconception page is here. The simple life cycle, life cycle example depicted in the standard is not sufficiently detailed for implementation directly in the plan. You have to understand that 
That's a genetic life cycle where they have a genetic ID by 26 different nations around the world all trying to speak English with each other. And they are trying to predict on paper on how those activities, what do they mean? How can you assess them? That's what they try to do in general. But it may not be 100% one-to-one applicable on the project activity in your specific application. That's why what we say here is, it's an example. It's a genetic example to explain to you things, but you may have a more detailed life cycle that you may have already in your working principles of your procedures of your engineering department, as an example. Often the second bullet, and that's clearly something which I come, come across, I would say, weekly. Every training we do, every consultancy or every assessment we are involved in, People, they all talk about SIL class. They all talk about SIL 1, SIL 2, SIL 3 very easily. They don't even think what it is. It's SIL 1. What does that mean, SIL 1? And where do you get your failure data from? For me, a failure data, which is given by or a database or maybe by an investigation team or maybe by a vendor, whatever it's coming from, it's just a theoretical approach maybe on where this data is coming from that may not reflect your installation behavior experience. That means often engineers, they blindly focus, the moment they have a sill that sits between the range that they were required as tolerable uh, risk reduction in the first place, they will say job is done. And they may not consider anything at all from film safety management. So what we say in here is, it's clear that the entire edition one and the entire industry was too much focusing on SIL and calculations rather than trying to increase the quality of the activities by implementing certain uh, strategies like assessments, independent assessment and expert judgment that is often not being considered still today. And the third bullet, commonly misunderstood that accepting the grandfathering clause of existing systems, that nothing has to be done to manage those systems. For those of you who are maybe familiar with the definition of the grandfathering clause, that means you have an installation that was built before the release of that standard. Example, you build a plan in 2008, 2016, the new edition two came out. That means you cannot have been full edition two because it wasn't even out yet. But you are giving an escape route, I call that. You have been giving now a grandfathering clause in the edition two, where you will have to make an assessment on your existing older installation that was maybe based or built on edition one. And they will give you there a opportunity to prove what safety risk reduction have you been achieving with the older installation that was built on requirements that were being released before the edition two was even out. And commonly people think, well, you know what? 2016 came a new edition. We have a new modification now. We can still do the modification or maybe an, uh, an extra loop or whatever we are, we are building. We can still do it as the rest of the plan that was engineered 2008. That's not what the purpose is. If your installation needs to comply to the SIG 511, then they ask you to comply to the edition two with again the opportunity to prove that the previous installation that was built by an older standard, older standard, you need to prove with the grandfathering clause, we call that, on what kind of risk reduction you are achieving. But more to the point is typically what we find is to older installation is, especially when you talk about the installation equipment such as shutdown valves, a classical end user operating company have no mentality to know what the useful life could be of that valve. In other words, as long the valve is moving, do not replace it. When the valve dies, doesn't work anymore, then you are allowed to replace. Do you really believe it makes sense to predict with a SIL number precisely the availability of a valve where you even have no clue on the mission time, useful lifetime, and also have no clue on failure data? Take my word for that. You're wasting your time and you would waste certainly my time if I would make an assessment. So those are typical items that people totally forget when they are looking at older installations. And the last bullet, 
Well, it's clear that if you compare a control system engineer for a BPCS DCS with a safety engineer, well, the safety engineer may not open and close that program in the safety PLC every week. The same as maybe the control engineer is doing. That means from a competency point of view, we are a lot more afraid of the safety engineers because they don't practice enough their know-how on specific items because typically safety systems are not easy to be touched under a running process because you always need to guarantee that your safety is still being maintained. And that's also why we said that the safety engineers refresh their training and ongoing practical experience needs to be monitored as part of the competency. And competency degrades over time. I give you a classical example. As I've been telling uh, or told you before, I've been doing this program, the TOV Rheinland Competency Review Program. I was one of the uh, founders at the beginning of the program to set the program or the, the system up. And it was 2004, 2005. In the meantime, I retrained people that I trained 10 years ago, because after 10 years, you have to redo your exam. So you better do first the training before you take the exam. Otherwise, I don't think it's going to be easy, that exam. It's possible. I have seen people uh, managing the exam, but I've seen people, they redo the training and the exam, and they fail the second time. And then the question is, what happened in this 10 years? Well, maybe they never really practiced functional safety. Maybe they only need to have that cert certificate to have an assignment on a specific job. But if you don't maintain it, if you don't use it, you will lose it. That's always our recommendation when we train people. All right, Maro. We are at the closing session of the webinar. That's the famous and the best book on the market, which is the Safety Engine System. Why I'm saying it's the best book, it's a bit, uh, I'm a bit, uh, let's say, uh, cynical as usual. Well, I have written a chapter, if I remember, chapter seven and eight. Chapter seven is the SIG 1511 review on edition two, and chapter eight is a safety requirement specification where I will write one example of one safety instrument function with 29 items, how a safety function shall be described and shall include, et cetera, et cetera. The rest of the book is, of course, also great. It's an entire book focusing on safety instrumented system. 55 or 58,000, whatever was the latest number of those books have been circulated in the market. If you don't have a book, you can send an email later on or you can register uh, on the website of GMI and they can send you a book or try to give you a book through one of their offices around the world. We are just starting to update the Safety Academy, which is uh, launched in 2017. 2017, there was no reason to think that everyone would do only webinars and, uh, and e-commerce and virtual training because there was no COVID in 2017. So now with the whole COVID story, with all the webinars we have been doing, we have now a new intention to update those safety videos. And that is what I'm, uh, I'm tasked to do starting off this month. And the next coming months, you will see some newer safety videos also on the safety portal of GMI. And in the last final closing of the webinar slides is the training slides. As Mauro was mentioning already, we do provide functional safety competency. As you may have heard during the webinar, there is a little bit that I know about the competency for the functional safety, because we have been doing that for a, a long time now. We are also providing fundamentals of cybersecurity, which is a new program on the TOV Rhineland portal since the last two or three years now. The fundamentals needs to be first passed in the exam before you are allowed to go to the last bullet here, which is the cybersecurity assessment training course. That's the assessments that we are also training. Of course, we do customized in-house trainings. That means for specific requirements for specific clients, depending on from client to client, what are their activities. And then there are also more additional free webinars you can follow in the future. Plus, as Maru mentioned, we also have them all recorded. And that is my last slide. C5011 lifecycle support, PHRA, low pass cylinder termination, SRS, FSM, and assessments. That's all what we do as additional consultancy. It's not only me, of course. We have a team of people helping with me, uh, but I will manage them. And then the last bullet is the lifecycle support of the 62443, which is the most common 
I call that the operating technology or the OT security standards for the industry. And that's also something that we can help you with. Okay, Maru, I will uh, stop my slide and I'm trying to stop sharing. And well, yes, uh, there is a, in the meantime, a question. The okay. question is, how, do, uh, I how do I get access to the, uh, to the, to the book? Uh, you just drop me an email or you go through the website of GMI uh, and uh, you can uh, you can fill the form to get it um, so that's uh, easy I will type uh, in the in the answer I will type my my email address it, it was in the it, it will be in the in PDF slide. format you will receive in the slide which was not shown right now uh, just give me two seconds and I will answer with my okay so this is you should have received the did you receive my email you should have address received. yes it's okay. it's in your answer model it's still shown in the answers eh? okay good uh, now I will uh, now start the uh, question and answer section before to to to, to sorry yeah no i i just want to say to the participants listening still to the webinar we need another five to ten minutes max those are questions that were registered during the registration that i just captured and i took, took a few interesting ones okay Maro. yes be before to to start with the question and uh, giving the, you the answer i want to just to say uh, that this what you have listened right now, it's one of the many seminars we are doing. Uh, we are doing seminars, so you can follow up in our website uh, or to over LinkedIn. Uh, you can see which other um, webinar are planned. We have webinar on functional safety. We have webinar on ICX. We have webinar on uh, cyber security topics. We have webinar on application. You know. We deliver uh, barrier and relays, uh, and we have uh, we we like to share our experience uh, in specific applications. So you just check it. Either uh, you can follow some some of the old webinar through the YouTube channel, or some new one as as you did right now. Now let's go for the next ten minutes uh, uh, to the next two pages uh, with question and answer. So. Here, first question, who is responsible to follow the FSM for SIS in project? Now, this is the easy one, Imaru. This is the one we already yes. answered, but I will repeat again. So who is responsible to follow that FSM? Well, as I stated before in the, in the, in the webinar, it is for everyone. The simple answer is anyone doing an activity in the life cycle needs to follow also food safety management. Even when you are in phase one, only active, even if you only do your HAZOP team member, well, the HAZOP team member, the HAZOP leader needs to prove that the people in his team are competent as one. And then they will also have to monitor on what is the result of that HAZOP report. How do we now know that we have maybe missed items, but there will be also some judgment from the HAZOP leader on that. But there is no independent assessment requirement on that phase number one. However, once you're coming out of that phase one, you're starting in phase number two, which is the famous LOPA. That means that some people are not using LOPA. They just skip that phase. They say, we don't want to do LOPA. We're just going to take a risk matrix and we're going to take the risk matrix in a conservative approach where we go one still higher than needed. That's, for instance, a German chemical giant that I'm thinking of as a company. Well, they skip LOPA, but they still have the safety requirement specification. And now comes after the SRS, Stage one is the first time that the IEC is asking to make an independent assessment. So that means design and engineering companies, certainly they will also have to think about food safety management. System innovators, they are typically receiving all kinds of data and they are building physically some hardware and combining it with some application program, maybe inside the safety PLC, that's also for them. But also throughout your project, when you are selecting all your manufacturers and your suppliers, well, they, those suppliers, when they supply a product as per 6.15.08, okay, 
they also will have to have an FSM. And some of that information will need to be filtered down into your FSM requirements of your project. Operating companies means the end users. Again, it's also for them uh -huh. because safety teams or maintenance teams or operation teams, they all have to follow the FSM. Yes, Maro. Here, here we have a very, very long question. Can I read I leave it to you? Yes, please. Okay. Because when I read it, I may recall it from a system integrator's perspective. Not all vendors will have 61508 compliant FSM system in place. Period. In what circumstances should the integrator insist that component vendors have a standard compliant slash audible FSM system in place? Question mark. Do the standard 61508, 61511 allow any leeway to vendors to leverage its QMS certification instead? Like for instance, ISO 9001, API, Q1, etc. That's an interesting question. Okay, an interesting question. We need to be neutral on how we answer, but it's clearly in the sense of the question how it has been asked that that person is maybe the system integrator itself and he's struggling. Some of the vendors are saying they are supplying a product, but they don't have an FSM. Well, my first bullet is trying to highlight the following sentence for you. When a vendor claims to sell you a safety device or a safety interface, as per 61508, that's the first question. If the vendor would claim that, then there is no doubt that vendor shall have an FSM in place and prove it, period. So there is no gray area in that. Any vendor, how small the interface device is or how expensive that device could be, doesn't matter. Anyone claiming SIG 1508, SIL X, as per SIG 1508, cannot claim this without having an FSM and prove it how they have used the FSM in their development of that device. Second bullet, FSM chapter six is a normative requirement of the 61508. Again, that's the vendor's uh, special standard for functional safety for EEPES. E stands for electrical, second E for electronic component on that device. And the last is for programmable electronic safety related systems. Well, that chapter six is already in there since 1997, edition one, remained in the edition two in chapter six in April 2010, and will remain chapter six in the maintenance edition release number three, which has not been released yet. So in other words, if some vendor is blowing some whistles in your ear, trying to sell you something which is on the market since maybe 20 years or whatever it is, anything after 1997, edition one has been released. Question is, why would you select a vendor claiming that they sell you something safety if they have missed the standard, which has now been on the market for 24 years? That would be my question to them. Have they been sleeping? Are they all of a sudden interested in safety? where at the beginning they would not have that standard uh, complied to their equipment. That would be my question if I would be the engineer on the other side of the table. Yes, Maro. Good, last two questions. Okay. So the question is, is there a template to prepare a functional safety management plan in accordance with IC61508? And the answer is, of course not. I mean, the standard standard gives you ideas. They say you shall get this, you shall do that. They will not hold your hand as an engineer. They will not say do it this way and this way and this way. And templates, especially for 61508 for the manufacturers, I'm pretty sure that there are some specific templates cir circulating among certain vendors. Maybe they have something in common, like, you know, they have been... Uh, how would I explain that? They have been purchased by a larger company and all of a sudden the smaller company becomes part of a bigger company and all of a sudden they are dumped the template from the previous company and say, you will follow that. That is often what I see that people struggle with. On the other side, the 6.15.11, uh, 
That is pure know-how. So we as GMI, also not in the book, we're not giving you a template. I've seen some templates um, circulating. Even if you Google them, you will find some templates. My recommendation would be do not automatically believe what you find in Google or what you find free of charge, because that is pure know-how and we don't give our know-how. We don't throw it in the streets because then we have no consultancy anymore, which is clear. So bottom line is food safety requirements are generally described as what is expected from a standard point of view. And I give you some guidance, maybe in part number two, which is the informative section. But the entire standard remains as a good engineering guideline. And as I said before, it's all down to competency and to the judgment of that expert judgment or the expert engineer that is working on that project. Maro, yes, thank you. Last, last question then. Yes, in reality, we have two questions again, but very short. Uh, can you please arrange a similar section for selection and introduction of safety relays? Uh, I, I answer if you don't mind, uh, Tino. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, as I was saying before, we have several webinars uh, we will arrange also in the next future uh, and on several topics, uh, including uh, application, including uh, how to select uh, a safety relay in the, depending on the specific application. So we will go through several applications and we will. Uh, discuss about uh, which possibility we have uh, in selecting uh, uh, our safety relay. Uh, very last question before to, to say goodbye to all. First of all, thank you very much for, for your participation. And uh, uh, yeah, we would like to, to have uh, your, uh, your, uh, your last feedback uh, on uh, how we did perform. Uh, and uh, you still have uh, the question and answer box uh, uh, in case you have any uh, comment on uh, on that uh, recommendation. Uh, yeah, comment whether it is good or bad. Uh, it is always the wolf, uh, helpful for us to improve uh, and to provide better, better things uh, next time. So please don't, don't be shy, give us your uh, valuable feedback. Uh, I see you are still uh, present here. The number who started is still here with us. So it's, uh, it is already a sign for me that uh, you did uh, you know, a great job as usual, huh? oh, no, no surprise. And... Uh, now the question, we have a question in the meantime, Tino, huh? I take the, 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 this last second. I didn't we see have a okay. open, okay, hang on, open. Yeah. Here we go. Question is, can you organize a session of control HAZOP or C HAZOP? Um, I can answer this lively. I can say, yes, we can. I will send you my email address um, but as i got so many email addresses i have to get the one that i want to give you the correct one of course so copy so if you send me an email on this email address then i will follow up and we can certainly see what are the requirements when where and how we could support that okay maro Okay, in the meantime, uh, we collected almost uh, all, uh, um, all feedback on the la very last question. Uh, and uh, okay, feedback from your side uh, are very, very good. Uh, excellent, almost. Uh, uh, so thank you very much for, for this feedback. Uh, and thanks for spending this time uh, with us. And we look forward to have you again. Uh, so just follow up our website you can uh, you can uh, you can uh, you can check whether we have other subjects that might uh, might be of interest uh, for you for those of you who are still here with us uh, you will receive together with the presentation also a certificate of participation so again thank you very much thank you very much all the best and uh, see you next time <laughs>